Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the progressive movement and America's Third Awakening. The Third Great Awakening, which began near the end of the 19th century, was the first Great Awakening in American history that didn't center around a religious revival. Now, that's not to say it didn't involve a religious revival, but for the first time, the religious aspects of the Awakening played a supporting role, while on center stage was a movement to remake and transform America through a sweeping agenda of social reforms to make it a nation that's more just and more moral. And the name for this movement was the Progressive Movement. On the surface, you might think that the Progressive Movement looks nothing like these religious revival movements of the First and Second Great Awakenings. But once you look past the surface, what you will quickly see is they were merely different aspects of the same moralistic spirit sweeping over the country at different points in history. They all involved a new national enthusiasm to delve into social and moral questions and to make the country more just and more moral. They all involved a turn away from pragmatic politics and pragmatic issues to moralistic issues of right and wrong. And they all launched comprehensive campaigns to transform America through social issues. So on those terms, The Third Great Awakening isn't just a Great Awakening. It's arguably the most successful Great Awakening that America ever had. By the end of Reconstruction in the 1870s, America entered a long period of stagnation and corruption and money chasing and political decline that we call the Gilded Age. The Second Great Awakening had more or less burned itself out through the horrors of the Civil War. And that was followed by the violence and turbulence of Reconstruction. So by the time Reconstruction had ended, America was no longer so interested in great crusades to save the world. Most Americans were now interested in calm and rebuilding and making money. And great campaigns for national moral reform had all burned themselves essentially out. But while politics had stagnated, industrialization was rapidly remaking America. In just the few years since the Civil War, a war that had been fought in a predominantly agricultural country, now there were railroads suddenly spreading everywhere. There were factories springing up. The cities were now bursting, and the small towns that had been the backbone of America were draining out as people were looking for new opportunities. There were immigrants streaming in to take these new opportunities. There were the inventions of new marvels like the electric light bulb. There was national markets for products. Food and new products were coming from faraway places and going everywhere. And for those who had been able to take advantage of the opportunities this presented, like the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, there was a new class of millionaires. Despite all of the new opportunity and technology and prosperity that industrialization had created, there were not yet any rules for this new economy. So naturally, people got exploited. A lot of these new industrial jobs, they were sweatshops with terrible conditions. They employed child labor. They worked people 14 hours a day. They had unsafe working conditions. And so you saw things like the infamous Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, a fire in which 143 garment workers, mostly young women, some as young as 14, threw themselves on windows or burned because their employers had locked them into the building to prevent them from taking breaks. These new national markets... They provided access to goods to people that they didn't have before, but they also allowed swindlers to ship impure foods and quack medicines all over the country with no accountability because nobody really even knew where they were coming from. And so you saw things like the stories recounted in Upton Sinclair's The Jungle of the meatpacking plants with unsanitary conditions and abuses of the workers. Green spaces were disappearing. Immigrants, many of them Irish and Catholic, were crowding into tenement houses without access to education. 
the establishment had locked them out of the system. So they started to form political machines like the notorious Tammany Hall so they could exercise some power and influence. But those political machines, they didn't really care very much about notions of good government. And then on top of all that, these national businesses that had emerged, they were getting so rich and so powerful that they learned that they didn't even really need to compete in the market. They could just use their market power and their influence to batter their competitors and behave as abusive monopolies. By the 1890s, a new spirit began to flourish in America. And it's centered around the urban middle and professional classes, particularly in the Northeast, among people who were pretty educated and comfortable. And most of them were younger people who had grown up since the end of the Civil War amid all of the prosperity and corruption of the Gilded Age. And they were upset that nobody seemed to be doing anything about all the serious social problems that had now emerged since industrialization had begun. They were angry at all the corruption and the abuses and simply the fact that America no longer seemed to be working the way it was supposed to work. They wanted fairness. They wanted efficiency. They wanted good government. And most of all, they just wanted to live in a decent and moral society without exploitation or abuse. And they became the heart of a new social movement to reform America. And it was called the Progressive Movement. The Progressive Movement was less one united movement than it was a loose alliance of people and causes that had all flourished at the same time among the same types of people in America. It included muckraking journalists writing in places like McClure's, people like Ida Tarbell and her famous expose of the abuses of the Standard Oil Monopoly. It included charity workers who were flooding into the cities to help the urban poor, people like Jane Addams and her Hull House or others in the settlement house community. It included political activists who were working to change laws, people like Frances Perkins who worked to change the laws of New York in light of the Triangle Shirtwaist disaster. It included conservationists like John Muir. It included modernizers like Frederick Winslow Taylor, who was preaching his gospel of efficiency in business and government. It included religious figures like Walter Rauschenbusch, who had come up with this idea of the social gospel that he was promoting, that it was a Christian duty to change institutions and reform laws to make America more moral and to blunt the hard edges of capitalism. And it included all of the armies of people who would come out into the public square to push over the finish line ideas like women's suffrage and temperance. The progressives threw themselves into a flurry of new causes. They worked to end child labor, to create maximum work hours, to end the sweatshop conditions in the factories. They set up networks for charity, things like the settlement houses or the Salvation Army. They cared a lot about good, clean government. They wanted to clean up the corruption of the Gilded Age and wanted to break up the political machines and to let the people directly elect their own senators. They championed antitrust laws to stop national businesses from fixing prices or from unfairly using their market power to coerce their competitors. They cared a lot about conservation. They wanted there to be green places for kids to play in the cities, and they wanted national parks to help conserve the environment. They worried a lot about the spread of impure food and medicines. So they eventually championed creating a new agency, the FDA, to make sure that food and medicine was safe. And they cared a lot about efficiency. They even helped to create a new science, a science of business management, to ensure that institutions were run with rational efficiency. What all of these progressive causes had in common wasn't just the desire to reform America, or even the desire to eliminate industrial era abuses. It was also the method by which they all proposed to do it. And that was by harnessing what was at the time a novel innovation, one that was very much in vogue, and that was social science. Social science had emerged out of Newton's scientific method. The idea that we could use reason and observation to study the natural world and thereby discover the laws that governed it, laws that we could harness for our benefit. But by the middle of the 1800s, people started to wonder, maybe we could use that same method, the one that had yielded so many new technological marvels, 
to discover the laws that governed the social world of people. Maybe we could discover the laws that govern human societies. And then once understanding those laws, we could harness them to eliminate age-old social problems and to build a better future. The attraction of this idea to the progressives should be obvious because previous generations of reformers, they had always had to reform people. They had to make individual human beings more just and moral people and then hope that when those people were making decisions, they would make decisions that yielded a more just and moral world. But the progressives thought that with social science, all they had to do was tinker with rules and with laws and build new institutions. And those institutions would then yield more just and moral results, whether or not the people running them were just and moral themselves at all. As a movement to reform America using expertise in social science, the Third Awakening looks very different from the religious revivals of the previous two awakenings. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the progressive movement did operate hand in hand with another religious revival, one built around an innovation in theology called the social gospel. In the years after the Civil War, religious revival began creeping back in America, but originally under revivalists like Dwight Moody, with a style and a theology very similar to the Second Awakening tent revivals. But by the end of the 19th century, a new movement began to blossom. This one flourishing among people in the Northeast, among professionals in the middle class, among exactly the kinds of people who tended to be progressives. And that was the social gospel. Social gospel Christians like Walter Rauschenbusch, who wrote the book that came to define the movement, they agreed with Second Awakening revivalists that it was a religious duty to reform America in order to make the country into God's kingdom on earth and thereby bring about the second coming. But they thought that the focus needed to be on a completely different set of problems. They thought that we needed to reform America's social and economic institutions to deal with the problems of industrialization and capitalism, and that they needed to focus on the social ills that were affecting the urban poor. And they agreed with the progressives that the best tool to do this and thereby redeem America was social science. Naturally, social gospel Christians, they began to throw themselves into progressive causes and progressive reform. They became very active in progressive charity efforts and particularly in the settlement house movement. They also drove the explosive growth of things like the Salvation Army and the YMCA. And many of the leaders of the progressive movement were personally affiliated with the social gospel. The progressive movement and the world of social gospel Christianity in practice overlap so much that it can be difficult to see where these two movements begin and end. The social gospel, of course, wasn't the only religious movement to arise in the Third Awakening. There was also new movements like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Christian Science. There was great growth in enthusiastic denominations like Pentecostalism and the Holiness Movement. There was also new interest yet again in the occult. There was also the rise of a movement that came up to oppose social gospel Christianity. This was a movement that followed preachers like Billy Sunday and his so-called old time religion. It was a back to basics movement that took its name after a collection of essays that were popular at the time called the fundamentals. And they came to be called the fundamentalists. The Third Awakening even had its own version of the tent revival meeting called the Chautauqua movement. And the Chautauquas were wildly popular public assemblies meant to mix education and entertainment. They would host a mix of speakers and preachers and teachers and musicians and demonstrations in order to morally improve the spirit and the mind. They were essentially tent revivals with a little less of the revival. The progressive movement was particularly popular with women, much like the activism of the Second Awakening and for a lot of the same reasons. Progressive activism provided a new outlet and opportunity for women to engage with the public world, to take on positions of leadership, to agitate for change. And so not only did you see a lot of middle-class progressive women flooding into the cities to do charity work and to 
counsel to the urban poor, you also saw a lot of women take on leadership positions within the progressive movement. People like Frances Perkins and Jane Addams and Ida Tarbell. But the flood of women into progressive activism probably had the most impact on two particular causes of the progressive movement. Two causes that had been left undone by the Second Awakening, and those were temperance and women's suffrage. See, temperance had always been a cause that had been driven in large part by women. A lot of women saw it as a family-friendly social reform, one that would benefit children and families by stopping men from spending away their paychecks in saloons and coming home drunk and violent. So in the progressive era, you saw a lot of women taking on leadership positions to finally make temperance the law. And that was everyone from agitators like Carrie Nation to powerful organizations like the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But the flood of women into progressive activism probably had the greatest impact on the cause of women's suffrage, a cause that a few decades ago had been completely unthinkable. But now there were so many women engaging in progressive activism and taking on roles in progressive politics, and the progressive movement was becoming so powerful in America, it was now a cause that was impossible to deny. And so with the influence of women on progressivism, you saw both temperance and women's suffrage become subjects of constitutional amendments and finally become the law. There was also, however, a dark side to a lot of progressive causes. See, while the progressives wanted to help the marginalized and the urban poor, that didn't mean they wanted to empower them. This was, after all, a moralistic movement, one that wanted to use science and rationalism to improve society and the human race. And so progressives didn't just want to help the people on the bottom of society. They wanted to uplift and morally improve them which to them usually meant turning them into reflections of middle-class American values. And you saw this idea running through a lot of progressive causes. Progressive charity was often predicated on your moral character. If the progressives considered you of poor moral worth, you wouldn't get any help. Many progressives also embraced causes like eugenics, the idea that we could use the new science of genetics to breed a better human race and thereby eliminate long-standing social ills. And many progressives embraced, therefore, ideas like forced sterilizations to breed bad traits of character out of humanity, traits that they saw in people on the bottom of society. So these eugenics movements often felt their greatest impact on powerless people on the bottom of society who progressives saw as carrying bad traits of character that they hoped that they could eliminate. You also saw in a lot of progressive efforts to help the immigrants that were flooding in the country, hints of anti-Catholicism. Many of the progressive causes also were trying to not just Americanize the immigrants, but also Protestantize them. Ideas like public school were hoped that they would Americanize the immigrants coming into the country, but also Protestantize them as opposed to the Catholic schools. Or ideas like prohibition, was hoped that it would break up the political organizing of Irish Catholics in the taverns that were working for political machines. And it also was hoped it would increase the Protestant vote because Protestant women would be voting, but it was presumed that Catholic men would never let their wives and daughter actually exercise their franchise. The Third Great Awakening, like every awakening, saw a new spirit of moral revival sweep over the country and transform America. It brought an end to the Gilded Age, and it created a new political era in which Americans were looking to remake and reform everything in their country. It launched energetic new social movements. It launched new spiritual movements and a religious revival. And it left behind an ambitious agenda of social reforms. Americans during the Third Great Awakening ended child labor. They imposed maximum work hours. They cleaned up the sweatshops. They created the antitrust laws. They fought political corruption. They built parks and national parks. They built public schools. They created the FDA. They passed prohibition. And women finally won the right to vote with women's suffrage. The achievements of the Third Awakening are so staggering that arguably it is the most successful awakening in all of American history. Why did the Third Great Awakening happen? Well, 
It just happened to flourish when a new generation had come of age, the generation that had grown up amid all of the corruption and money chasing of the Gilded Age. Their elder generations who had lived through the devastation of the Civil War, ever since they had turned their attention to things like making money and building. But this new generation who had grown up in the peace that followed, they were looking around at all the corruptions and the inefficiencies of Gilded Age America, and they wanted to tear things down in order to reform them and make them better. So while all of them didn't throw themselves into a religious revival, as it happened in previous awakenings, this generation was quite eager to throw themselves into a moral revival, a moral revival to reform and transform America, to make it more just and more moral. The Third Awakening burned through the early 20th century with the dramatic presidencies of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson until America went through the trauma of the First World War, followed by the meandering prosperity of the Roaring Twenties, at which point the Awakening spirit started burning itself out. And by the time Black Monday came and Wall Street crashed in 1929, the Awakening spirit was gone. America now was fully focused on digging itself out of the Great Depression. It was no longer interested in thundering through society with great progressive reforms. And so it stood through a depression and a world war and then a period of rebuilding in the post-war boom until a new generation came of age, one that was defined by that post-war boom and all the peace and prosperity it created. And they started looking around at society and seeing imperfections and thinking that they could do better. And it all happened yet again. America started a fourth awakening, and it's burning through America still. Thanks a lot for watching, and if you enjoyed the episode, please give it a like. And make sure you tune in to the next episode, because we're going to be talking again about American politics in the 1960s amid America's fourth awakening.